Now let's say if we have an object hanging from a ceiling and we decide to apply a downward force to it. This object is under tensile stress. The tensile stress is force divided by area. Now because this object is in equilibrium, if there's a downward force, there must be an upward force acting on the object. And that upward force and the downward force extends throughout the object. So whenever an object stretches, it is under tensile stress. Now the tensile strain of the object is the change in the fractional length of the object. So let's say this is the original length, L0. Then when it stretches, it's going to become longer. And so this new length, or the change in length, that's delta L. So the tensile strain is going to be positive delta L divided by L0. And keep in mind, delta L is the change between the final length and the initial length. Now let's say if we have a column that rests on a horizontal surface. And if we apply a downward force on this column, then there's going to be an upward force acting on it too which basically equates to the normal force exerted by the surface. Now a portion of that normal force is going to be equal to the downward force that we apply to it. The normal force is going to be the sum of this force plus the weight of the object. But if we take out the weight of the object, then a portion of the normal force is going to be equal to that downward force. And those two forces causes compression. It causes the object to decrease in slef. So this object is under compressive stress. So the compressive stress it's still force divided by area. So in this case we have a circular column so the area is going to be pi r squared. Here's the original length of the column and delta L is the change in length. So this time delta L is negative because the length of the object decrease. So the compressive strain of the object is negative delta L divided by L initial. Now you need to be familiar with the maximum stress that an object can have. So for instance, let's use concrete as an example. The ultimate strength tells you the maximum stress that an object can have without breaking into two parts or breaking into pieces. For example, the maximum tensile strength of concrete is 2 times 10 to the 6 newtons per square meter. And the maximum compressive strength of concrete is 20 times 10 to the 6 newtons per square meters. So if you're dealing with the maximum tensile strength, that's going to be equal to the maximum force divided by the area. If you're dealing with the maximum compressive strength, that will also equal the maximum force over area. So when you hear the words tensile strength, compressive strength, it tells you the maximum stress that can be applied to material. So these values represent the maximum force over area. Now notice that concrete's compressive strength is stronger than its tensile strength. So what this means is that concrete is very difficult to compress. If you try to compress it, it's going to be strong in this direction. However, if you try to stretch concrete, let's say if you try to pull it apart, it's weaker in this direction. So it's a lot easier to pull apart concrete than to compress it. So concrete is very useful if you're trying to put weight on it. But if you're trying to stretch it, it's not as strong in that direction. Now don't forget about this equation. When you're dealing with tensile stress or compressive stress, 
if you need to calculate the change in the length of the object, that is delta L, you can use this formula. Delta L is going to be 1 over E, where E is the elastic modulus or Young's modulus, times F over A. F is the force applied. A is the cross-sectional area, times the original length, L0. Now, Young's modulus, or the elastic modulus, you can look it up in a table. And it's important to know that the elastic modulus is the ratio between the stress applied and the strain of the object, or the fractional change in the length of the object. So this is another equation that is useful. So make sure to use the elastic modulus when dealing with an object under tensile stress or compressive stress. Now what about if an object is under shear stress? So let's say if we have an object, like a box or a book, and we apply a force. The object is going to move in this direction. It's going to deform like this. And it turns out that there's another force acting on it. The force that you apply to the right, the ground is going to apply another force towards the left. And so it's going to deform like the shape that you see here. Now let's turn this into a 3D structure. So this is the cross-sectional area. That's A. And this is the original length. And this is delta L when dealing with shear stress. So we're going to have a very similar formula to the last example. Delta L is going to be 1 over G times F divided by A times L initial. Now this equation is very similar to the last example. The only difference is we have a G instead of E. E represented the elastic modulus, which is the ratio between stress and strain. In this example, G is the shear modulus, which is the ratio between shear stress and shear strain. So it's still stress over strain, but just with a different type of situation. Now, the shear stress is still force divided by area. And the shear strain is delta L in the horizontal direction divided by L0 in the vertical direction. So that's a little different. So keep this in mind. The shear stress that's acting on the object is the ratio between the force applied and the cross-sectional area. And the shear strain is simply delta L divided by L0. So G, the shear modulus, is going to be F divided by A, the stress, divided by the strain, delta L over L0. So let's review what we've learned. Let's say if you have an object with two forces pulling the object, causing it to increase in left, this object is under tensile stress. And whenever you have an object where the forces are decreasing the length of the object, this object is under compressive stress. It's being compressed into a shorter object. And whenever you apply a force, to change the shape of the object. Basically, let's say if you push your hand on a book and you push it down and towards the right and you cause it to deform in this direction, then this object is under shear stress. My drawing is terrible, but you get the picture.
Now there's something else you need to be familiar with when an object is under sheer stress. So I'm just going to draw a 2D version of the object. So we know we have a force in this direction, and there's a force in this direction. So the net force is zero, because we have one going in a positive x direction, and another going in a negative x direction. But what about the torques? Is the net torque of this system zero? Let's call this F1 and F2. Relative to the center of mass, F1 wants to create a clockwise torque, which is basically a negative torque. F2 also wants to rotate the object this way in the clockwise direction. So that's another negative torque. So this object's not balanced. It wants to rotate in this direction. So for it to remain in equilibrium, there must be another force, a downward force, that prevents it from rotating. And this force is not the only force exerted by the ground, but the ground must also exert an upward force. So let's call this F3 and F4. So notice that F3 creates a counterclockwise torque. And the same is true for F4. It creates another counterclockwise torque. And a counterclockwise torque is a positive torque. So now, the torques are balanced. So the net torque acting on the system is zero, and the net force acting on the system is zero. So it's in translational and rotational equilibrium. So these aren't the only forces acting on the object. You have two forces acting on the, in the x direction and two forces in the y direction. So this one is in a positive x direction, this is in a negative x direction. This one is in a negative y direction, and that one is in a positive y direction. So if you have to draw a free body diagram, don't forget about the two vertical forces. So let's say if you have a book, and you push down on the book with your hand. There is a horizontal force that you apply, and there is a vertical force that you apply in the downward direction. And so the ground is going to exert a horizontal force to counteract this one, and a vertical force to counteract the downward force that you apply.